and we can press go. Thanks. Yep, everyone's in. Yep. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the North Sydney Local Planning Panel meeting um, of the 6th of September 2023. Uh, this afternoon on the agenda, we have six items, and this morning the panel uh, in together, the panel visited all of the sites so that we have an understanding uh, of the context. And we have also had the benefit, like you have, of reading the council officers' report that have been on the website for uh, some week at this point in time. Uh, this afternoon, the procedure will be we will hear from objectors, submitters, and then we will ask the applicant representatives, including their architect, to respond to any of the issues that they've heard from submitters. And the uh, panel will probably have questions of the architect and planners representing the applicants as well. So that will be the, um, the format for this afternoon. We then close the public meeting. This is a public meeting. We then close the public meeting and then we go into a private session. And in the private session, we make a determination on each of the development applications before us today. And our um, decisions will be on council's website by Friday close of business. So that's the procedure. With respect to the panel here today, I'll ask them to introduce themselves and also to advise whether they have any conflicts of interest with any matter on the agenda. Uh, I'm Jan Morell. I'm chairing today's meeting and I have no conflict of interest. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Sandra Robinson, and I have no conflicts of interest. Peter Brennan, and I also have no conflicts of interest. And I'm Ken Robinson, the community representative on the panel, and I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you very much. Okay, so everybody, I'll just check with the Secretariat, everybody that um, we are expecting today is here. Yep. Thank you. So... Well, the first item on the agenda, it's 30 Myrtle Street, North Sydney, and this is to modify a development application uh, for which consent was granted earlier this year, and it's to increase the width of the balcony off the bedroom. In this afternoon, we have um, no, there are no written submissions to this matter, and we have um, no objectors listed to speak. Is there any objector out there that wishes to address the panel on this matter? No, very well. So we have uh, Marion Helmus, the architect, and Sarah Pohl and the owner on the, uh, the list. Are you both there? I can see um, Marion Helmus is there and uh, Sarah Pohl. No, Sarah's not. No, Sarah's in the sun, right? Oh, in the sun. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Right, very well. Thank you very much. Um, very well, if you'd like to address the panel on this matter. Thank you. And the, and the reason for uh, why you consider it is necessary or appropriate to make the modification. I saw you're on mute. I'm on mute. They're on mute. Are you, you're on mute at the moment. Can you unmute yourself? Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, can. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So we've actually requested four uh, changes within the uh, uh, section 455. The first one was to change the windows in the main upstairs, the, the main bedroom upstairs uh, from a 1.6 meter sill height to be able to lower it down to 900 sill height with the um, still keeping uh, frosted glass up to 1.5 meters, um, just to get more uh, light into the room and to have more of a, a sense of the outdoors rather than a boxed in feel. Uh, there is no overlooking um, issue we basically see roofs and um, and and a few skylights of on roofs. I have actually got a video from the upstairs from one corner of the proposed 
window to the other corner. I'm not quite sure if I can share screen and you can view the video. Yes, you have permission to share. Thank you. Okay, one second. Um, can you see this? Yes. yes, we can. Okay, so this is looking northeast from the northeast corner of the proposed window. And this is a view as you'd span across to the other corner of the proposed window. Obviously, the window is not there yet, but that's it. Do you want me to do it again? Not for me, I'm fine. No. Okay, all right. So that was the video. So in terms of um, privacy, we actually see nothing. Um, then the second, uh, just one second. Um, the, the second change we thought was to, um, to be able to have the balcony looking south of the main bedroom at 1200 height. One of the DA conditions was to put a solid balustrade instead of a see-through balustrade on that balcony, um, which we have done, and we, we're happy to do that. Uh, we feel that a 1200 balcony will actually allow my client to put a chair out there and enjoy the outdoors rather than stand at the balcony looking out. And in fact, sitting offers less uh, overlooking than standing. So um, if we can, uh, if we could increase the balcony depth to 1.2 from the 600 mils that was in the DA, that would be great. And we feel that that would offer more privacy in fact to the Southern neighbors. Um, the third point was on the ground floor to extend the sliding doors, door one and door two, so they meet in a corner. I think that's of no consequence to anybody really, um, but that's just to maximize light into the living areas, given it's a very, it's a battle ex block and it's facing south. And the fourth request was just to add two skylights to, to the rear bedroom um to get uh, um some natural light and and one of the skylights would be opening so you get fresh air right thank you for that um address for of what the modification application entails um i think probably that the only one that um requires the panel to give further consideration to is the balcony was approved at 600 and we're now seeking it to be 1.2 uh, metres in depth, as opposed to it was proposed as a Juliet balcony. Um, the reason that, as we know, it is in um, an area where there is a lot of dwellings around, and uh, that's uh, 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 we can hear your submission. Thank you very much for that. I'll just invite the panel to uh, ask any questions. Sandra, do you have No questions, thank you. Uh, just one question. Um, did you do, take a, a video uh, of the overlooking from the balcony? No, I, I haven't got one of that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Can I say, so I'm the owner who wants the balcony, who wants to be able to sit on it. I'm actually really keen to be able to sit on it and see the sunset, not so much looking south towards the neighbour, but looking the other direction where there's nothing, you can't see anything. It's just to be able to get a bit of the sunset at night because I don't have much look in that direction. I, I think when we went to the site today, obviously we, we couldn't access the uh, first floor because it's a construction zone, but we were interested as a panel uh, if there was any overlooking of the rear yard of the property to the south and the property to the south east. But, I've got a broken foot, so I haven't been able to go upstairs. Okay. I think there is a probably the top one fifth of the back door of the property south of us. We see probably the top quarter at best of the door, but we don't actually see any of the backyard. 
Yeah, and I guess um, as was just pointed out, the dwelling uh, when you if you were standing on that balcony and you looked to your left, um, they have a rear yard with French doors coming out onto their area. Um, that would be the one that um, would probably be most impacted. Yeah, and and that's that's the door that we just see the top, I think, quarter of. Well. You can Basically. see it from the backyard. You could be able to see, you'd see the whole door from the upper level. Mm. So the one to the left or the one in front when you're standing. Looking? Not not in front, not immediately in front, but to if you were standing on that balcony, you'd look to the left. Oh uh, yeah, I don't um, think those neighbours put any submissions in around that. I don't that, that, know, that, that we're, we're looking at the merits of the application and uh, it's not just submissions that we mm. take into, into consideration. Um, and my other uh, question then is the landscaping that is proposed would um, not really ameliorate any, um, any overviewing. Uh, so we were questioning whether, in fact, the landscaping at the rear, which is rather dwarf plantings, would be um, uh, increased, and in particular on that um, east southeastern corner. Potentially, so you want another tree put in, or yes, yes, yes. Um, at the moment, they're all very um, miniature type. Um, the elephant ears, they grow a little bit bigger in the summer. It's so, a very, very small courtyard, as, yeah, as you I'm saw. Not, that's another big tree because I've got a really huge tree there. Um, but it is, yeah. Um, All I'm talking about is to filter some views, I'm not talking about a screen as sure. such. Um, and yeah. I, on, on the landscape plan, um, Oh, there's a, is it an um an ivory curl tree that's currently existing in the corner? Um, I don't think there's. Oh, sorry. Um, so let let me just get to the landscape plan. There are no trees on that fence at the moment. Um, it's got okay. ivy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. From the neighbour's side. Right. Okay. So what? So what? Yeah. yeah. What will we be looking? We will be looking at um would be. Um, if the panel was of a mind to approve the additional depth in the deck, then yep. we require some um, a couple of canopy, small canopy trees to be planted in order to break those sight lines. Um, well, sight lines. Okay. I, I think we provided it's something that will survive in that position. Um, I think yeah, that would be you'd like, be happy to yeah, look at something like that. Something like that. It's um hard to keep things alive in that garden because it's very shaded. Yeah, I, I understand that. Okay, yeah. perhaps some natives would be appropriate. Ken, do you yeah. have? Yeah. A yeah. Uh, no, I have no questions. Okay, then righty go. Well, we'll be making our deliberations later this afternoon, and uh, it'll be on the website Friday. So it be. Thank you very much for Thank it. You. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is Unit 6, 19 Belmont Avenue, Wollstonecraft, and this is alterations and additions to a unit to allow the conversion of the garage to a media room and with a car space in front of it and for, um, an, for the roof terrace to be uh, partially enclosed for uh, an office stroke room on the rooftop terrace. Um, I have submitters listed to speak and the first one is Sean McDamara, the Secretary of the Body Corporate, Strata Plan, and uh, if you'd like to uh, address the panel, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good, apologies for my voice, I've got a cold at the moment. Um, I'm the Secretary of SP87918 Belmont Avenue. Um, and I've actually also been a licensed strata manager for the last five years. Um, as some additional context, my wife and I were the first to purchase at 19 Belmont uh, from the refurbishing developer in late 2012. And I was the primary committee liaison with the developer regarding issues with their work. So I have a fairly deep knowledge of the original development of the building, the refurbishment in 2012, 2013, the establishment of the owners corporation and the subsequent meetings and bylaws over the last 10 years. 
Um, I've been a committee member since the first AGM and chair of secretary for seven of those 10 years. So please feel free if you have any questions around uh, the Strata Plan and the Owners Corporation, um, just feel free to fire them off to me. Um, the OC over those 10 years has generally been supportive of owners increasing their own amenity through proposals for lot improvement. And the approval for lot six and seven to undertake works covered by um, lot six's current proposal also addresses a potential maintenance responsibility for the OC, uh, for the Owners Corporation in relation to the balcony waterproofing. Uh, the lot six and seven balconies uh, represent approximately 40% between them of the balcony responsibility for the Owners Corporation. And if the uh, works are carried out, the proposal as approved by the Owners Corporation would actually see the lot owners become responsible for the maintenance of those areas, including the waterproofing. This formed part of the OC's decision to approve the uh, proposed works uh, via bylaw. Um, since uh, incorporation or uh, registration of the of the strata plan, the Owners Corporation has been pretty uh, proactive in ensuring the bylaws convey appropriate responsibilities of repair and maintenance to owners while retaining the Owners Corporation's rights to ensure work is conducted by appropriately, appropriately qualified contractors. <clears throat> and under conditions to minimise impact on other owners and residents. To date, the Owners Corporation has seen no need to amend the strata plan to reflect strata approved works. Bylaws have been more than adequate to encode the required terms and conditions on all approved works to date. And in many ways, these bylaws supersede any responsibilities conveyed by strata plan amendments. Uh, the vast majority of the area impacted by the proposed development for lot six is on existing lot property forming the uh, balcony um, as defined in the strata plan uh, there's a relatively small area of affected common property at the front and uh, in a small cavity at the back uh, between the property and the main block and the uh, balcony um, so the oc basically considers a strata plan amendment as being unnecessary Notice there were some conditions uh, suggested in the draft uh, consent. Um, so it feels like that would be a considerable impost on lot six, as well as the OC in general, to change the strata plan. Presumably, if lot seven proceeds, uh, decides to proceed in the future with the similarly approved works on their side, they would then also be required to, to undertake strata plan amendments. Um, we feel that uh, as an owner's corporation, any conditions that council deems necessary on the works for use, you know, type of use or use of the common uh, property or works, such as the uh, parking area for small cars, can more easily be achieved through the amendment of the bylaws that have already been set up. My understanding of, of the situation is that lot six would not encounter difficulties in having any such amendments passed both by, by the owners. Uh, for example, signage for small cars only, um, use as only a, um, a car space, etc., as well as amending the the amendments to reflect any uh, changes in the design that the uh, council requires versus what's already been approved. Um, Lot 6 has worked very closely with the Owners Corporation to ensure its uh, requirements are met, um, and I don't see any uh, barrier to a continuing um working uh, to make sure that both rights and responsibilities of all parties are covered. Uh, that was basically all I all I had, if anybody has thank, any questions. Thank you, Sean. I just have one question. It's about then um, that rooftop being used in terms of acoustics. And do you have any bylaws which cover um, the treatment required for that area? Um, we don't currently. We, we have, as always, under the Act, um, the requirement that any floor treatments are to be um, suitably treated to minimise uh, impacts. At the moment, uh, I will point out what we have is a is a slab, concrete slab, on which some waterproofing and then tiles have just been up, been put on. So there's already a fair amount of acoustic uh, travel of noise from those balconies. Um, the original uh, balconies before refurbishment had some sort of thick foamy type thing underneath uh, pavers. Um, so we've we've lost both acoustic and um, and uh, thermal 
protection from those and they've been sort of living with that for the last 10 years. So I would imagine if any if there's any hard floor in there, that any requirements on uh, acoustic performance would be covered under the Act and the appropriate uh, BCA uh, standards. Okay, I'll just see if anybody else has a question. Um, no, thank you. The, the, the roof terrace itself, has it always been a roof terrace, the, the whole... Yeah, you know, the whole concrete section. Uh, yes, from the original design, there was original to roof terrace with some uh, garden beds uh, at the southern end. Okay. Thank you. What was the access? Sorry? What was the access to it before? So there's a um, sort of a walkway from the front block to the back block. So from unit six and seven, they each have a little walkway that's about um, just over a third of the width of the balcony out onto the balconies. So they have always been um, lot property and sole use by those two lots. Um, there was a bylaw that approved um, basically covering over the cavity uh, to make it full, to make the exit from the units full width with uh, decking, for example. Um, and this proposal for lot six and seven as approved in the bylaws would allow them to basically have that full width on the full length of the balconies for their use. So that uh, area that's shown as an existing deck, which is timber, uh, that originally was, was was that a walkway and it's been extended? On, on yeah, that, that was yeah. about maybe 40% of the width. Okay. A walkway from the front block to the back block, and that's been overlaid with the decking through a bylaw um, that was approved back in um, 2014 or so. Just one question. Um, does lot seven do? You, have you approved a bylaw for them to do the same work? That's that's correct. So basically, it was a um, um, dual approval bylaw just to give them both because it made sense to get the approval done under one bylaw. Um, then the you know the the decision on whether to both proceed or not was based. You know that's an individual lot owner's decision on whether to proceed or not. So lot six has decided to proceed at this at this time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we also have Roland Rosenbach. Are you there? Are you just observing? Roland's there. Yes. Sorry, just having a bit of uh, a fight with the mute button. Um, just observing at this stage. Um, I guess the only thing to add is um, uh, in relation to Sean's comments um, uh, and iterating that um, given that uh, all of the conditions that are relevant under the, that the DA can be adequately uh, met under bylaws and in fact and in, mo in most cases um, more than uh, uh, met as opposed to the the strata plan um, just to further um, request that uh, consideration be placed to not have that strata plan um, condition uh, added to the conditions of the development consent. Uh, right I just have one further question which goes to the unit entitlement itself and given that will be a small car space only in front of the existing garage as there's no objection to an 88 instrument being placed on the title of the unit to ensure that future owners would be aware that it can only accommodate a small car. Um, can you just elaborate what um, and that instrument is sorry? Oh, it's just, it's um, something between, uh, it would be signed by council, signed by the owner of the apartment to say that that car space is designated as a small car space. And it, what it is, it, it um, alerts future owners to the fact that um, it's not a, uh, a car space that can accommodate a large vehicle. It is only for a small car only. Uh, yeah, but... That seems reasonable. Um, and just to reiterate, if we look at the, the bylaw that um, made that car space, uh, or so, sorry, the, the entry up until the garage um, designated as exclusive use, um, and it clearly shows that that exclusive use only goes um, down to um, the extent of the edge of the property and not onto the pathway. So I guess it's also inferred and um, expressly uh, conveyed in the bylaw, um, effectively the same piece of information. Um, yep. I, I have no personal issue um, with that extra instrument. Um, the only thing I was requesting is that due to 
um, the onerous nature um, or the impost associated with updating the starter plan and given that it doesn't add any additional benefit over and above all the other me measures that are being put in place, um, that's the only request that I have and I'm happy to go along with what you mentioned. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just very quickly put in as well, I don't see any barrier to the Owners Corporation approving an amendment to the bylaw with Roland's consent as required uh, to specify that that space is only for a small car um, and that um, you know, it, would, it would require another special resolution to, to change that away from uh, and with the consent of the owner of the time to, to change that away as well. So we can encode that and any signage requirements the council might feel uh, might be appropriate within the bylaw. And I don't see any, um, any barriers to that being approved by the owners corporation with my knowledge of, of everybody's opinions. Okay, then. Well, that completes um, the addresses this afternoon and our decision will be on the website by Friday. Thank you all for attending and uh, assisting the panel. We'll move now to item number three, which is five Little Wonga Road, Cremorne. And this is alterations to an existing dwelling for a new garage, lift, rumpus room and balconies. We inspected the site this morning and we actually met with um, the owner of the property and the only person I have listed to address the panel is the applicant owner and that is Jan uh, Taljard. Jan? Hi there. Thanks very much. Uh, I was expecting my wife to talk, but uh, I'll go briefly through what uh, just the additional information we want to provide to the panel today. Um, so basically, uh, rich, uh, we've got a long history of this DA. It was rejected by your panel in 2018, uh, mainly due to the fact that we had issues with the consent from the neighbours who were very uncooperative at that stage. Subsequently, the property sold to a new set of owners um, who are like-minded in terms of wanting to improve the building. Uh, I've been working in conjunction with their architect and we have uh, several discussions with them about the way forward. And we are both want, uh, submitting DAs of a similar nature, hoping to improve the overall amenity of the building, um, bring it up uh, to modern standards, et cetera. Um, so we have, uh, completed bylaws and both have been registered for both properties uh, owners to submit the DAs. Um, so from a legal standpoint, all the issues previously have been resolved. Uh, the other issue that was previously raised by the panel, there was a missing tree on the plans. Uh, I had the survey updated to show those trees. Just note that none of the trees will be affected at all by the building uh, since we are actually reducing the, the structure on the side of a building where these trees uh, are, are located. Uh, thirdly, um, there was just some concern about the actual excavation. Um, I had a second set of engineers and geotechnical uh, experts come in and review the plans. They were both happy with what I had proposed. Uh, the only change that the geotech guys suggested was that we leave a 500 millimeter shelf of unexcavated um, rock on under the party wall, just to ensure that the party wall doesn't get affected at all. Um, I have amended the plans to show that uh, shelf. Um, and I think, um, oh, and then of course, so uh, currently the situation is we have, parking for two cars shown on the plans at council. Uh, when we remove the stairs, it will actually uh, improve a way we can exit or enter into the garage. The garage is of an adequate size to handle two cars. Uh, and the fact that the space in front of our property will now not contain those current stairs just means that the turning circle will be quite adequate for us to uh, be able to reverse out of the the garage and proceed down a little longer road. Is that it? Yeah, and obviously uh, the reason why I've been uh, proposing the veranda at the bottom was that the upstairs balcony is in quite a bad state. It is currently cantilevered using timber under the floor of our main lounge. The floor is actually being lifted by the cantilevered uh, timber uh, supports. 
So I wish to support the veranda, the current veranda, or the, the replacement of the veranda properly using steel, uh, a steel structure from the uh, veranda that will be placed on top of the, the garage. All right, I think that is it. Thank you very much. I'll just see if there's any questions. One moment, please. No, thank you. Uh, no, thank you. No, uh, very well. And um, uh, because there seemed to be a little bit of confusion when we were out there today and also with the previous court approval for that studio, um, and given the parking situation, you would have would you have any objection to a condition which required the uh, dwelling, the building, to be used as a sole occupancy, a single domicile? Uh, that's correct, yes. So a part of the plan is to close off the separate entrance so there will only be a single entrance from the main internal staircase of the house. So there will no longer be any way to access the, the, uh, the, the flat from outside. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, we'll make a decision. It'll be on the website Friday. Thank you. Great, thank thank you, you very much. We'll move now to item number four. And item number four is 27 Alamang Avenue, Kirribilli. And this is alterations and additions to um, a dwelling, including a, um, a bedroom addition and an extension of a deck on the upper level. As I understand it, it's a modification. No, it's a, it's a DA. separate DA. Separate DA. Very well. Um, well, the history of it is that um, this particular provision was the matter for a condition issued previously. Uh, but now we have a separate development application for the dwelling. Now I have, um, we do have submitters to this matter. Uh, James Lovell, is James Lovell there? Yes, very well. I'll just check that the other um, applicants team are also there. Philip Corbin. Yes, yes, you're on mute, but that's okay. Um, and Gary Chapman. Uh, yes, yes. No, Chair. I, can, I can see you there. And, yes, John, and John White. I'm here, Madam Chair. I'm called Huddle Room this afternoon. All right, so is James Lovell there? James, uh, yes. James. Madam yes. Chair. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, thank you. Yes. Okay. Look, thank you for the opportunity to address you. Um, I'm a consultant town planner and I act on behalf of the owners of Unit 8, at number 27B, Elamang, Elamang Avenue. Um, I prepared a submission in relation to this DA and I also prepared a supplementary submission for the purposes of this meeting. So for that reason, I don't want to repeat much of the information in those submissions and I'll, I'll be quite brief. Um, my client's primary concern and really their only concern relates to the loss of views of Sydney Harbour, in, including part of the cove. Um, and in that regard, this is a DA that's adding a bedroom and extending a roof terrace at the third level of the building. Um, and this DA itself is expanding upon a previous DA, and that previous DA itself expanded upon a CDC. Um, so that's the history to the matter. As you said earlier, Madam Chair, this is a um, the bedroom that's proposed and the roof extent, terrace extension um, are substantially the same as that which the panel considered in February. And as you recall, um, the panel deferred the application and, and required the applicant to delete that uh, bedroom and terrace extension. Um, that was subsequently done and on that basis the DA was approved. And you'll see on page two of this assessment report it says that this DA effectively seeks a revision of a previous panel decision and I think that's quite clear. Um, but at the end of the day this is a DA that involves loss of views of Sydney Harbour um, from the living room and bedrooms of my client's property. And that view loss is being caused by a portion of the building that breaches building height control, which is a development standard, and also the side boundary setback control that's contained in the DCP. And those non-compliances directly contribute to this loss of view. Um, so basically, the applicant in this instance has accepted, I'd say I could describe it as the benefit of the consent that was granted, but they've at the same time rejected the burden that that condition imposed or that a resolution of the panel imposed upon um, them to delete. And that, that, was, that deletion was the very specific element that was central to the consent being granted. Um, 
just in terms of the scheme that's now before the panel, there have been some very minor adjustments to the scheme and the setback to the side boundary has been slightly increased by 500 millimetres. However, it's still a portion of the building that breaches the building height control and it still doesn't comply with the side boundary setback control. What it's effectively doing is the approved development included a large bedroom at the top floor of the building. Actually, James, could I, could I ask you to come a bit closer to your microphone because it's sort of cutting in and out a little bit, yep. That's okay. So basically what this application is doing, there's a bedroom approved at the top story of the building, the third floor of the building. It's basically converting that space to a very large walk-in robe and a study, and then it adding this bedroom into the sight line that is affecting my view, uh, clients' views from their living room, um, from their apartment. And um, basically my clients have also indicated to the council that there's, there's not a significant concern with respect to a development that doesn't impact upon their views. And it's a relatively simple exercise to analyse those plans and, and, and identify that there's ample space at that top floor of the building to increase the setback from the side boundary, reconfigure the study and the walk-in robe, which the walk-in robe it itself is as large as this bedroom, and to provide a bedroom, a study and a robe at the top floor, but to not impact on the views from my client's property. And as I said, those views that are being affected are being impacted by a portion of the building that breaches both building height control and the side boundary separate control. So um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions if there were any. Thank you. James, have you done a, um, a view loss analysis yourself? Uh, I've been to the property, my client's property, and I've analysed the um, Montart, well, the computer generated images that were submitted by the applicant. I did say in both of my previous submissions that it's unfortunate that the applicant didn't um, do one of two things. One would be to undertake photo montage in accordance with the court's practice note, or alternatively to erect height poles because computer generated images are a static image. And it's very difficult to uh, get a full appreciation of view loss from a static image, image, albeit that static image was not prepared in a montage form and was not prepared in accordance with the policy. But evidently, there is an impact on the views. The applicant acknowledges there's an impact on the views. The um, computer-generated images identify an impact on those views. And that portion of the building, as I said, is breaching the height control and the side boundary. And there's ample room to remove that portion of the building that's impacting on the views and still provide a bedroom, a large walk-in robe and a study at the top floor. And, and there was already a, an approved bedroom in the scheme that the council approved previously, but which didn't impact on my client's views. Okay, I'll just check. Can I have any questions? No, that's okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, James. Um, you mentioned about the non-complying setback at the upper floor level, which I think it's required to be 2.5 metres. If that bedroom one was moved back that further, I think 400 millimetres, would that make the difference to your view or do you think it need to come back further than that? It needs to come back further than that. It would, and, and that's an analysis that normally an applicant would need to undertake, but it needs to come back more than that, bearing in mind that this portion of the building is not, not just an issue of compliance with the side boundary setback control, which you could increase to 2.5 metres and notionally achieve compliance. Even in that circumstance, the portion of the building that's blocking the view is still non-compliant with the height control. It may well be that the building may breach the building height control. It would be compliant with the side boundary setback control, but the setback needs to be increased quite materially to achieve a no, no impact on the views. And there's ample space for that to occur. It's a simple exercise of looking at the plan. There's a study and a walk-in robe that's as big as the bedroom itself. And there's a hallway that goes nowhere. So there's ample space to do these changes and not impact on the views from the non-compliant portion of the building. Thank you. Thank you. No, no very well. Now um, we'll hear from Philip Corbin, the architect, and Gary Chapman, and John White as well. I, I'm in your hands as to which order you wish to address the panel. Um, Madam Chair, we thought um, Mr. The Cor architect is on mute even though he's talking. Yeah, we thought Mr. Corbin would start first. He can talk through some of the design amendments that have been made. 
from the scheme that you um, saw? You're still, you're still on mute, uh, Mr. Corbyn. Hello, right. can you hear me now? Sorry. Thank you. And in addressing us, I'd like you to respond to the concerns that have been raised by the um, planner on behalf of an applicant, uh, on behalf of a submitter. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and panel. Um, I will endeavour to do that. Um, we intended that I would simply go through the revised proposal and where it had changed, and then Mr Chaplin would respond to the issues specifically relating to planning that have been raised by Mr Lovell, if that um, works for you. Um, as you've um, pointed out, this is in fact a new DA. It's not a Section 4.55 amendment nor a Section 82A review. It's specifically been um, adopted, that approach, so this could be specifically addressed um, at this one issue about the addition of the bedroom. Um, as you're aware, the situation that we were faced with, that the previous DA consent basically had a condition which said there could be no impact whatsoever on the adjacent neighbours. Hence, in that circumstances, and given that the building was under construction, our only option was to then amend an application, was amend the application to delete this bedroom in its entirety. Um, that allowed us at least to actually maintain the construction under keep the construction underway whilst we could then address what was the best alternative. We felt then that the best approach to be would be to then lodge this new ADA but reduce the size of the bedroom. And that's quite a substantial um, reduction. Now, Mr. Lovell suggested that it's actually quite minor. It's actually a 25% reduction in the size. We moved the bedroom back 700 millimetres from the north. We set it back off the side boundary by 500 millimetres. We reduced the ridge height by virtue that we've made the building, the, the room narrower. And we also reduced the roof overhang um, to the north as well. Um, the net effect of that was that we get a, quite a significant reduction in that room size. The room as it stands now is then 5.7 by 4.5. That's not what I would suggest is an unreasonable size room for a property of this nature. I think the most important document to refer to is our drawing DA15, which actually does have a, a detailed CGI prepared both by a surveyor and by um, a considerable amount of work done by the practice to make sure it was accurate as possible. We had sought to actually obtain or to do a photo montage, but we were denied access by the owners to actually um, take a photograph on this property. So we've had to rely on the information that was provided to us by the um, um, by council's planners photograph and by deducting our own information. I can rest assured that that CGI is very, very accurate. And as you can see on DA15, there is a clear indication of what that degree of... Sorry, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Sorry. If I could just interrupt there, I, I can share that image if required, that plan um, panel, uh, because I was going to take you to it as well. If it, okay. if it, does it assist you okay. if, uh, if I yeah. share? Uh, yes, well, I, um, perhaps um, you could take us, take us, take us to it, um, Gary, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the architect doesn't need to take us to it, okay? Okay, so, Madam Chair, I just, if I could just summarise what's important in that particular document. Unfortunately, I can't share it because I'm actually overseas. But the the view that retained is, in fact, 95.4% of the view is retained. So the reduction of view is only 4.6%. And I'll, us, I'll hand this over now to Mr Chapman to um, go through in further detail. Thank you very okay. much. Just before you go, Mr Corbyn, I have a yes. question for you. Um, yes. It, it would appear to be rather unusual to have your study, to have your walk-in wardrobe and your ensuite not directly adjoining your bedroom. And why wouldn't you use the study area um, with a reduction in your um, perhaps walk-in robe uh, to be the bedroom and then the study be on the other side? And in fact, you wouldn't need the hallway. Well, we've actually utilised the hallway as part of the bedroom in the revised design. 
So well, that's, that's not what that's not what's before me. Um, yeah. This. I could the door, but still not. Are you referring to the plan DAO4? Are you referring to plan, plan DAO4? Yes, yes, I have it. I can see you've got a door at the other end, but in fact, that hallway could be utilised um, as bedroom area. Um, oh, it actually is, Madam Chair. It, uh, I've, it's, it's the only part that's gets cuddled in the yellow is that part, which is the new addition. So well, the hallway it's... is part of the bedroom. No, well, yes, but the, but then you have the study at the end of it, so it's not completely. No, I don't accept that um, at all. So, but go on. Um, why couldn't you reverse? Well, I, I, why couldn't you well, reverse? I mean, wait for my, wait for my question. Why couldn't you reverse the study and the bedroom, and do some wall changing there? Well, our request from our client was to have the bedroom on that north with access to the deck and also to have a study that obviously took advantage of the view as well. Um, it was... Well, couldn't the... you do that if you swapped the bedroom area and the study area, rearranged your hallway and you still get the, the, the space you need and they're both facing north with the deck? I, I, I'm trying to understand what you, what the implications of what you're asking for is. All Are I can you, say is then you could yeah. set it further back from the side boundary. Well, I, I don't think the side boundary is the, 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 the side boundary isn't the isn't the key to actually mitigating view loss. I mean, we've set that back by um, two metres. It's actually a two story portion of the building. The setback for two stories is 1.5 metres. Um, Mr Lovell is arguing that it should be 2.5 metres because it's three storeys, as Mr Chapman will explain. It's that third level that is excavated underneath the existing building and existing, and hence we've had to require to actually use that excavated level as the existing ground line. Um, if your request is for us to reduce the bedroom further, Mr White's on, the, um, on this panel. We can discuss that with him if you wish. Very well. Well, um, any other panel members have a question for Mr um, Corbyn? I have a question for Mr Corbyn, but I think that yes. maybe the planner will answer it. Um, there was discussion then about um, what happened previously where you were asked to retain the view and the only way to do that was to delete the bedroom completely. Um, yes. I'm wondering, is and using the language relevant to a clause 4.6, is there a more skillful design that gives um, your client what they want, which is, you know, a, a bigger bedroom space, but retains the view and 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 therefore is consist more consistent, I think, with the objectives of the height standard about um, uh, preserving existing views and 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 you know those those two things together, the more skillful design and the yes about views. Yeah, I'm very cognizant of the world's skillful design in this situation here. What we're trying to do is to both minimise the impact of the view on an adjacent neighbour. I might add this is a neighbour who borrows that view over two side boundaries. Um, we have endeavoured to actually reduce that room size to make it a reasonable size so that it, um, and that I would, in my terms, call um, a skillful effort to do that. It's not, as, as in the previous DA, to remove it entirely, to remove or to re diminish the view in its entirety we're virtually removing the room and it's when in order to actually minimize the view or to reduce the view it meant reducing but to um deleting the room in its entirety and to my mind that was unreasonable in the end that did have an adverse effect on the overall design of the building okay thank you gary if you could address the panel uh thank you madam chair um panel members um look i'm thinking what I'll do is take you to some images um, that just might assist you. You've got them with you or they're certainly part of the development application and um, they're part of the attachments to the report, but it'll assist me if I just talk through them and it might help us have a discussion about what, um, firstly, um, the view issue, um, and then I'll take you to clause 4.6 and lastly, the, um, the site setback requirements. So, um, hopefully 
this is coming enough, visually enough for you to see. Um, and maybe if I've just blown it up there, probably too much actually, sorry. I've got to go back the other way. Um, on the left-hand side at the top is um, the view, as Mr. Corbyn has pointed out, from a surveyed um, view analysis, but using the photos from the council officer and the report, um, we couldn't get access to this unit. Um, I reiterate that this view is across a side boundary, in fact, across two side boundaries. Um, but putting that aside, the, the image on the top left-hand side is the approval with the removed bedroom, which was in this component here. And it's showing you the expanse of view that was retained by that requirement, the, by that approval. The, the, the image on the right-hand side is what we're proposing now. Um, this image actually includes existing um, cross gable roof form that is on the site now that is going, that's forward of this bedroom, which is here. So there is some, there is some gain in view in the foreground. This red alignment is what is being lost. When you look at the overall view, and you can go to the council officer's report and see these photographs, that they're consistent with what you're seeing here, there is a 95% retention of, of, this, of, the, of the water view, the interface with foreshore. There's not an iconic view here. Sure, water and interface are important, not saying they aren't, but there's not that, that loss of resulting from this corner um, of the bedroom and the eave. Now, in my mind, that's a, that view impact is minor. Um, that's, the, that's the assessment of the council officer's report. We came to that conclusion as well. If you were to set this room back further that, that's being discussed, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure that with, with that you're really going to pick up a significant uh, more amount of view um, than than what's proposed than what we're seeing here. Um, if I could take you now to the clause 4.6 request, I might just leave this image up there, but I'll take you to others shortly. We're talking about a clause 4.6 request where. It, it, it relies on the Weeby test and, and the first test of Weeby, which was that um, you achieve the objectives of the standard. I'm not going to take you through each objectives because this matters down to objective B, which is view sharing. This is a this this proposal retains views. It shares views from across the site and it retains 95% of those views from those lounge room and bedrooms. The, it, it gets through the test of meeting the objectives of the standard. The second, the second component of the clause 4.6, obviously, is, is environmental planning grounds. Now, I'll take you to this image. It's in the clause 4.6. It's, it's in the report you have in front of you. This is a photograph, I hope you're seeing that. That's a photograph internal to the site of an existing excavated level. That's the result of the 1.75 metre variation to the height control. It is internal to the site. Um, there's, been, there's been a couple of court judgments here. Better was older, Meerman's newer, um, and the findings of that most recent one it's not inconsistent with better, but is that is that when you measure height internal to a building from an excavated level, it, it distorts the height plane the, and the variation. The more practical approach, which is what I've taken in the clause 4.6, and I'll take you to this elevation, which is the elevation that you're that that's similar, or if not the same, of the view analysis. And the more consistent approach, or a practical approach, sorry, is to take the level. This is a finished level along the side boundary and at the elevation of the dwelling. And the blue line above there is the 8.5 metre height line. As, as you view this property from the side, from the side boundary, from, from unit eight, 
that that is what you read. You read it from the boundary level and two stories. And percep visual perception, the proposal complies with the height control. It is only that excavated level that results in the variation. Um, that leads to the side setback control um, and the, the 2.5 metres for three storeys. This is a two-storey component of the dwelling from the existing level to the boundary. It, it, it actually complies with the side setback control. Um, I'm just looking at my notes from um, Mr Lovell's submission. And look, I think I've largely covered it um, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, I'll just see if the panel, oh, does Mr. White wish to address the panel? Mr. White? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, look, you know, I, I, I have listened to a lot of stuff and it's very hard as a layperson to, uh, to get into the middle of these, uh, you know, very technical discussions, but I did pick up from Mr Lovell that he said that the panel last time we met said that that bedroom needed to be deleted. And, you know, what I'd heard from the panel and, uh, and, and yourself in, uh, in coming to the conclusion was to go away and more skillfully design what needs to be done, you know, to, uh, you know, to actually minimise and share, uh, share the views. And uh, we did take that very seriously and we did listen and we went back and we spoke with, um, you know, with, with Mr Corbyn and uh, with Mr Chapman to reduce the size of the bedroom and to try and minimise the impact. And as uh, Mr Chapman went through, you could see we made a number of changes to try and make it better for everyone. And we were, you know, very happy when we came up with, uh, you know, with 95% retained view from the, uh, from the, the place two doors up. Um, as I said, very hard as a layperson to listen to different, you know, I've, I've read the submissions from both Mr Lovell and Mr Chapman. Um, you know, there were, you know, clearly differences of views. So we uh, retained John Cole lawyers to actually go through and give us legal advice because I couldn't tell it, you know, left or right. And he came back and said to us, look, you know, that everything that, that Mr Chapman and, uh, and Mr Corbyn are saying is, is right. And that, uh, and that the proposal is reasonable. So thank you for thinking about it again. Um, you know, we're trying very hard to make it work for everyone. And, uh, and yeah, that's all I can say, unless there are any questions. Okay, I'll, I'll just see if there's any questions of um, Gary or Mr White. No, no, thank you. No, I think you covered that. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much all for um, assisting the panel in its deliberations on this one. And the decision will be on the website Friday afternoon. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next matter on the agenda is the last one. No, second last. Second last one. Last one. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, twenty to twenty-two Waruda Street, Kirribilli, and um, this development application um is for the refurbishment of a residential flat building. And um, in that regard, we have a number of people who wish to address the panel. And I'm just trying to find my um, <laughs> list of speakers. We've got tangled up with all the maps. <laughs> right here. Here we go. Uh, yes, I have um, a number of submitters. And if you could just indicate that you're here with which would be good. Satarth um, Parmaswaran, you there? Yes, I can see you online. That's fine. Alex mm -hmm. Allen. Alex yes. Allen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Leslie Martin. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Robert Duval. Yes. Yep. Thank you. And yes. and for and for the applicant, I've got Jeff Mead, 
Thank you. I can see you're there. Jeremy Bishop. Thank you. Um, Michael Morgan. This was, oh, we're, we're all together in the same room. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ed Horton and Danny Flynn. Is that right? Yeah. You're already yeah, we're in the same yeah, room. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So can we start with um, Siddharth first, please? Oh, hi. Um, I just hopefully you can hear me. It's, it's Shanta Che, actually. Um, I'm the owner of 118 Kirribilli Avenue uh, in Kirribilli. And um, my husband sends his apologies um, for not being able to attend as he's, he's got a meeting clash today. So I'm with my daughter and maybe she might make some noise. So apologies if there's any further noise in the background. Um, so we own a terrace, um, mm. which is directly north of um, the Opera House. And um, as, as we all know, we're, we're speaking about um, 20 to 22 Ruda Street. Um, and this uh, DA application proposes to extend the building um, height um, as well as width, uh, just on the top level. And that's our main concern. Um, and it actually sits, as we look at the Opera House to the left of um, our, I guess, view. And um, generally, we're really supportive of um, this DA application, as I think, you know, with the quality of the design and the build, it's going to bring something um, great to the neighbourhood. But the two, I guess, the main concern we have um, is the loss of harbour views. Um, and I just want to show you just the views that we will have, well, we currently have. Um, so just hold for a moment. I'll just pull up the document, share my screen with you. Uh, okay. Um, so hopefully you can see this. Um, this is the current, uh, if, I, if I scroll down a little bit more, um, it's not this one. Sorry. Okay. So um, in the um, heritage um, statement, it actually showed that um, the, the uh, original building didn't have, like one of the images didn't actually have um, the... Uh, the fence that's up above, but I guess over time it's been erected and you can see it's got a semi-transparent um, fence. Um, but as I guess with this DA proposal, it's looking to actually block out um, a lot of this as well as go up and actually expand the width of the, I guess, um, facilities that which are at the top here. So I'm just trying to pull out that particular um image from from the report but I, I don't seem to okay here we go have it here we go so so yeah it's just this particular issue that we have which is the loss of views to the harbor and also to the uh, botanical gardens the royal botanical gardens as you, as you can see in height and it's actually going up further um, and and it's going a little bit wider and it's blocking out all of that, you know, semi-transparent um, um, fence there. So I guess we're just seeking to see if the DA can be retained within the existing um, um, building envelope. And I guess, yeah, that's our, our main, yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Um, now I'll move to Alex Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair and panel, uh, for allowing me to speak. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm currently uh, outside in Strathfield, so apologies Thanks, for, for any any bad quality in microphone. Just one moment. We need to stop sharing from the previous um, Yep. System. Yep. Sorry. Yes. Pressing on here uh, to stop uh not sure we've, we've stopped it on our okay end. Oh, okay great thank you thank you very much right sorry thank about you. that alex thank you yes so um 
having been uh, a long-term resident in Waruda Street for 15 years and an owner for nine and a half years, living in a heritage listed building at the end of Waruda Street. So the access is um, past 22 up to the cul-de-sac of 29. We're adjacent to um, Admiralty House and in the conservation area of Waruda Street and as well as being in a heritage listed building. I'm the company secretary and representative for 11 owners. Um, overall, we're in favour and support of the sustainable and skillful redevelopment of 22 Waruda Street. It's been a significant source of concern for us over a number of years. Um, due to, you know, uh, street parties and house parties occurring on common properties such as the rooftop. Um, we've had all kinds of activities over the years, which has impacted us uh, negatively from an acoustics point of view and also, um, you know, just from a general behaviour point of view. So I think changing that common property space, which has been in existence for over 15 years on that rooftop, certainly complements uh, all of the existing neighbours uh, around from an acoustics point of view, making it a, a private access, putting landscaping on and vegetation on, I think will help reduce that noise impact significantly for all surrounding neighbours. Um, so I really would like to compliment the developers in that respect, because I think it will be for the better good of all surrounding neighbours. And I'd also like to make that point that just also to be concerned with any alterations to adding any common space at a lower level could impact negatively um, from an acoustic point of view. Um, as was the case with 26, that was our concern with the acoustics at lower levels. The design currently allows for you know, balconies to be harbour facing um, and ensures that you know, unit holders would remain within their unit and so then doesn't significantly impact surrounding apartments. So just noting the acoustics um, that could be impacted at a lower level. The other thing that I'd like to point out to the community uh, committee as well is um, Beulah Street is incredibly narrow um, in terms of parking. Most of the vehicles, it's a one-way street, most of the vehicles park as you would drive down the street on the right-hand side. And the current garage and parking access is actually beneficial for residents to be able to park on that right-hand side because it allows you to reverse park up a very steep hill. Um, I think any changes or putting in additional spaces on the public parking would be detrimental. The other thing is access for emergency vehicles, such as fire brigade, to get down Beulah Street. It would be challenging um, if you were to change and close off any car space accessing 22. Uh, we've had issues where refuse trucks can't get down. Uh, and it's the same with the, so not only Beulah Street being incredibly narrow, and so I think retaining the existing ingress and exit of both entrances on Beulah Street would be beneficial for residents. Um, but also the motorcycle spot that's currently outside the entrance of 22, that's been problematic in the past for um, people either where we've had residents or non-residents unable to do a three-point turn at the end of our um, street, but reverse parking, uh, reversing um, and then either going into the motorcycle spot that's there or going into our vehicle. Nearly all of my neighbours have had our vehicles damaged in one way or another due to the narrow nature of Beulah Street and Waruda Street from 22 through to 29. In fact, I'm having a dash cam fitted this afternoon, costing me $2,000 to catch out people who are damaging my vehicle in the street. So I would just point out that it's, it's beneficial the way that the design is now where it's landscaping. And I actually asked council to consider whether you actually remove that motorcycle spot completely um, so that you basically have no parking on the left-hand side of Beulah Street as you would have on the exit of Ruda Avenue through to Kirribilli, and that would allow better access to delivery trucks, emergency vehicles, and that kind of thing. So um, they're just the points I'd like to raise. But um, I think the landscaping that's been done really anchors it to the building. Um, the only thing that I would also ask is, could council look at Beulah Street Wharf area um, and consider currently the landscaping that's been done there is being used as a latrine for fishermen. 
Um, it's been neglected significantly by council. Um, and so I think it would be good that council could also address that at the same time that 22 is being redeveloped. Um, the sooner that the development can carry on and proceed would be also beneficial to us because we're just concerned with it being an overall giant fire risk right now. Um, you know, sitting there empty. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You'll realise that many of those things you mentioned are not within our remit. Um, they, are, they are matters perhaps you might want to take up with council later on. Yes. Okay, so can I move to um, Leslie Martin? Leslie Martin? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I'm the chair of the Owners Corporation of Admiralty Gardens. The address there is 5 to 7 Peel Street. So we are actually outside of the notification area and we are to the north of the um, 20 to 22 Waruda. But the proposed um, pushing of the envelope on height and width has a has a concern for loss of view of iconic views of the Ar uh, opera house, um, particularly from the mid level of our building. Um, so we've put in a submission that outlines those concerns, and um, I think uh, we line up pretty well with some of the other neighbors. And beyond that, unless you have any questions, I've said my piece. Thank you very much, uh, Leslie for waiting on. It's been a long day. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And Robert Duval. And he's observing. So he's oh, is he observing? Observing only. Very well, I noticed. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now go to the applicants team. And um, Jeff, I'll put you in charge of uh, who to go first and speak. And if you can also um, address the concerns that have been raised that are pertinent to this development application. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jeff Mead, Planning Consultant for the Applicant. Um, I will um, deal with the objections, um, but before doing that, um, just wanted to give a brief background to the application. Um, as you would have been informed by Council staff, this is an application that we've worked with extensively for, for a long period of time and made several amendments um, to um, throughout that process. Um, the relevance of um, those amendments are they go directly to some of the issues that were just raised by objectors and I'll talk to the um, to the relevant aspects of that um, but also um, to appeasing um, a number of issues that were raised in the early parts of um, of the planning assessment um, in terms of um, the background to the project as um, you would have seen on the site um, is a, a building um, that is is well above the height limit it's existed on the site for many years but um, of significance is that the building's um, subject to a, a, a fire order. Building's currently vacant, um, had 27 um, strata units within it, and essentially this project is um, an opportunity to rebirth that building um, in terms of not only addressing the fire order, um, but um, creating significant improvements for the site. Um, in terms of some key metrics on the proposal, um, the development does in fact um, lower the, the, the maximum height of the building on site today um, by 1.6 metres. Um, it reduces the number of driveway crossings um, on the site frontages from eight um, to three crossings. The landscaping across the site is significantly increased um, from um, approximately 5% um, to almost 30%. Um, and the permeable services through the detailed landscape um, approach to the site um, results in a change from 13% of permeable surfaces to 45%. So the whole idea of the proposal has been to um, significantly upgrade the site and its contribution to um, character of the locality, um, but also to um, address some of the shortcomings of, uh, on the current site. The existing building has a parking um, shortfall. Um, there's 27 units in the in the building and there's approximately um, 17 or 18 car spaces um, within the building. Um, so in addition to this proposal, um, dealing with obviously complying with council's DCB controls for the on-site parking, um, we reduce those, those driveway crossings um, from eight to three, which has allowed um, significant um, landscape and streetscape upgrades um, to all frontages of the site. Um, that takes me to um, probably um, the most relevant point from the applicant's point of view. 
the development assessment report is 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 thorough and um we applaud um council staff for the the rigor with which they've approached the whole assessment um as you will have seen the council officer has um viewed this site from circular quay walking across the harbour bridge within the locality um visited neighboring properties to uh look at um at, at view impacts um and, and so on and that has led to a collaborative process of of amendments um to improve the building um, the only issue where we're apart uh, relates to uh, the recommendation that uh, the application be um, delegated to council staff um, off the back of amendments being made to reduce the driveway crossings um, on Beulah Street by one uh, by removing the northern crossing. Um, we strongly oppose that for a number of reasons. Um, and those reasons being um, uh, due to the benefits of, of, of what we're doing here. Um, firstly, as I said, there's a reduction already from eight to three driveway crossings. Um, effectively, the driveway crossing we're talk about, talking about um, uh, leads to an accessible car space that's directly um, adjacent to the unit that it serves, uh, which provides um, significant benefits in terms of um, adaptability, accessibility of that unit. But in terms of um, from a design point of view, um, that space um, is 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 um, accessed by a three point five metre wide driveway, has landscaping on each side of it, and a green roof above it, um, and will be secured by a palisade gate um, across the actual um, parking space and turntable. We say that from a streetscape and a character point of view. Um, there's simply not an issue um, with that um, to the extent that um, visually that would only be appreciated, that space would only be appreciated looking straight at it um, at an oblique angle up and down Beulah Street. Um, there would um, essentially, um, there would not be a perception of it even being there. That needs to be placed against the context of the increase in landscaping, almost six times the amount of landscaping that's currently on the site. Um, there's um, almost no landscaping um, within the front setbacks today. Um, that's significantly enhanced. And as I said, the permeable surfaces across the site as a whole. Um, so that's the only um, issue where we're apart with staff. We would urge the council to not accept the staff recommendation, but to approve the development subject to the conditions uh, that are recommended um, by staff. Just turning um, quickly to um, the submissions that were made. Um, firstly, as the panel would have seen in the staff report, um, there was um, widespread support for this proposal, um, as well as the objections that um, that are generated. In fact, I think there was nine letters of support, um, and, and many of those were related to the, um, to the significant improvements on the architectural quality, the landscaping, and um, the uh, removal of those driveway crossings, um, hence providing for traffic improvements and parking improvements. Um, just dealing with the objections very quickly, um, the first um, speaker from number 118 um, dealt with some um, view impact issues. Um, firstly, um, the image that was put on the screen um, is actually um, based on a, an earlier version of the scheme. Um, that was the original proposal. The view impacts from that property have been significantly improved um, through amendments made to the rooftop um, of the proposal, whereby we, we reduced building mass um, on, on the northern part of the rooftop um, and uh, also lowered uh, the, uh, the lift and stair access to that level. Um, so in effect, as you will see in uh, the visual impact assessment uh, report that is dated May, of this year, um, there is an updated image um, taken from um, the, not that unit, but the vicinity of that unit that shows in totality um, those units um, enjoy exceptional panoramic views um, to the Harbour Bridge, the Opera House, Circular Quay, and part of the Botanic Gardens. Um, the proposal, um, in fact, creates some view improvements on the rooftop by uh, reduction in the maximum height by 1.6 metres, removal of the existing chimney, removal of um, the white balustrading that's on the rooftop at the moment that um, conceals the view um, by um, replacing that with um, glazed balustrading, um, which obviously the view uh, moves through. Um, so in, in totality, um, there's, there's effectively a, a net zero um, impact on, on views. Um, there's some addition um, additional impact and there's some additional loss. Um, dealing, um, 
dealing then with the uh, speaker from Admir Admiralty Gardens. Um, again, that's dealt with in the view act impact assessment um, with photos taken from viewpoint 11 and viewpoint 12. Um, effectively, from that property, again, um, the 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 um, cumulative impact or the impact in totality um, is, is is a zero loss um, to the extent that there's some benefits um, through the lowering of um, the existing lift and stairwell, um, the, uh, uh, the, the the removal of the balustrading that I referred to earlier. Um, and um, as I said, through the amendments in this process, there's been improvements to the view loss um, to the extent of removing mass on the rooftop on the northern end. Um, so those um, those images from viewpoint 11 and 12 um, show um, an unimpeded view of the Opera House, the Botanic Gardens, the Harbour Bridge, Circular Quay, and what we um, would say are the icons um, of view. Um, so we say that there would be no reason um, that the uh, proposal would be refused on, on view impact grounds. Um, I'll deal with it only briefly um, because the staff report uh, deals with it in detail, but obviously the panel is charged with um, supporting a uh, course 4.6 variation for height. Um, the 4.6 variation for height is based heavily in, in the fact that there's um, the height that is established on the subject site by the existing building. Um, and essentially the height of this proposal um, reduces that maximum height and makes significant improvements to the built form um, in, in a manner that we say um, makes the building um, more sympathetic um, and compatible with the character of the locality. Um, there's there's several environmental planning grounds that we have advanced and the staff report um, doesn't in fact agree with all of the environmental planning grounds. Um, as the panel would well know, um, there only needs to be one environmental planning ground, um, though the staff report agrees with um, several of those. Um, we um, deal with 4.6 um, with with impacts. Um, there are no, uh, I've just dealt with view impacts. So the view impacts in our view are acceptable. There are no privacy impacts um, and no sh overshadowing impacts um, that um, emanate from the height breach. Um, the building, um, the, the, the general philosophy for this proposal, um, as we've advanced um, heavily in our documentation, is um, the idea is, is um, an adaptive reuse of a building um, now we accept that there's significant change to the building, um, but we are um, maintaining the structure um, of, of the building and that has significant ESD uh, benefits um, as opposed to um, demolishing and rebuilding. Um, that has been dealt with in a, in a specialist um, ecological report, which no doubt the panel would have had the benefit of, um, of as well. Um, I think that probably covers the main points that we wanted to deal with, but no doubt there'll be um, questions from the panel and um, that's probably the best way of advancing any further discussion. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Sandra. Um, thank you for the detailed presentation. Um, just drawing on what Chanter Che talked about, the top of the building, I'm yeah. looking at... Figure... Um, if you could put yourself on mute, thank you. Lovely, um, great. I'm looking at figure 22 and 23 in the assessment report. And I was just wondering if you could clarify, you talked about the um, removal of the white metal um, balustrade on the roof um, and its replacement with a glass balustrade. Um, those, those figures, so figure 22 in white. particular. Well, it's at the top. Um, it's stainless steel white. Is is that blue shade including or excluding the glass balustrade? The blue shades include. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, you've gone on mute. Okay. Sorry about that. Try again. Um, uh, so the blue shade incorporates all of the built elements, and so it does include the balustrade. Um, so there's an element above um, what you see in the background of that image of the parapet, above which there will be um, the balustrade. So um, the blue incorporates absolutely every built element. Including the balustrade. Oh, yeah. Including balustrade. Okay, just, so... Just a minor point of clarification, <clears throat> and this is, I mean, Jim can appreciate this, the... The balustrade is that palisade white yeah. steel, painted steel. 
Uh, it won't be glass. It'll be um, uh, stainless steel cables, which will somewhat disappear. So with the right. glazing, we, we talked with council about this over the last month or so, and we collectively felt that there would be a, it depends on what time of day and what angle you were looking at it from, perhaps walking across the bridge, you might get the western sun reflecting on it yeah, and it right. would be solid. So we decided to, two <laughs> reasons, we decided to delete the glazing balustrade. One was the re reflectivity and a risk of it appearing as a solid element. And the other one was maintenance. When we <clears throat> thought about maintaining that glazing, it would be very difficult to actually um, go over the side. Yeah, um, no, that's without great. Some, without some kind of, you know, and you couldn't hook yep. on because it was glazing. So we deleted that. And so, together, so just to to make it very clear, because the the two. Um, People from the community that have spoken have expressed concern that you um, you haven't included the proposed balustrade on the roof. Those two images from the report include that metal balustrade. That blue shade includes everything. It does. That, that's correct. And, and and just to the extent, and I'm I'm sure you're clear on this, but to the extent that it's shown as the solid blue, but it is an element that there would be that transparency through that tension wire. Um, right. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. No. Uh, um, uh, 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 sorry, is it possible to just um, ask a question or do I need to wait um, to be no. called? No, no. The, um, the procedure is that we allow you to make your submission. And okay. Then, yep. And then, we, and then we hear from the applicants and they make their submission. Okay. And yeah. Respond to various issues, and then we um, enter into our own determination privately. Okay. 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 So, so I don't have anything that I can say further. I just wanted to mention that that image is the latest. Is the latest from their um, report. No. No, it's not. Correct. It's right. No, it's not. I'm just advised. But as I said, it's not a question and answer. Thank you. Okay, right you go. Um, nothing further on this. Yes, there is something further. Um, uh, the materials and finishes, perhaps um, the architect might be there, Jeff, to advise. Yes, on yes what's uh, Jeff, Jeff. We, we, are, we, are, we are, the panel's concerned that, um, that this does not in any way um, um, stand out in terms of the harbour and in terms of, uh, as you are aware, the Opera House view, which it's in terms of the um, development application must be assessed as. So uh, we're just wondering uh, what, it, what it is that the applicant would be prepared to provide in terms of a suitable um, materials and finishes board. Um, Madam Chair, we have provided the latest materials board. Um, we understand that um, colour was a, a contentious issue throughout this whole process, despite the advice given by our own heritage consultant board, Radford, who supported our original proposal. Um, in speaking with um, the council assessment officer, we um, the latest finishes show a more muted. Uh, it's a grey, earthy tone as opposed to a stark, what was this is a stark white tone for the main facade elements. Um, and the brickwork as well has gone from what was perceived as a, a textured, silvery kind of brick, which that was the words of the um, assessment officer, um, down to again more to muted, earthy tones. So it's a lot more. Um, In collaboration with Council. Yeah. It's a lot more um, recessive and. Um, yeah, I, I do have both boards here, but the one that has a um, shiny finish, Jim, the top one there. Yeah, that's the uh, main one, Jeremy, that uh, you're talking about. That was to re the grey tone that replaced what was originally oh, yeah. white. Okay. Sorry, apologies. So it's yeah. a ceramic tile, but it's shiny, and that's the... The concern the is concern. that <laughs> when the sun hits that, particular finish that it won't be appropriate in this yeah. context. Apologies, the, the actual material that we're using is a, is a German product. 
um, and the actual sample is in transit. So what we've had to do for that board, if you look at the, the shiny flat tile is only there for the colour, and the the um, the sample, the photographic sample next to it is the actual textured tile. So it's not a flat tile; it's actually a textured tile which has got profile to it. So because it has profile, it won't actually shine like a flat tile. It'll actually be uh, a lot. A lot of it will be in shadow, almost like ribs. So we very much more subdued than a shiny tile. And is so, that de is that detailed somewhere that the condition can reflect same? Uh, the the finishes the, the, the way the finishes are nominated is actually that profile tile which on the legend says um canyon profile and the actual tile color mm. yeah, so just to be clear jeremy what you're saying is that it'll be the grayish color but yes. the profile of the white tile next to it yes that's correct yeah, okay. I, I think in the first sample board, we actually gave you a sample of the profile of tile. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so it's the same profile tile, but in the, the grey colour, so it's mm -hmm. much it's, more muted. So can I just clarify, we've got a set of conditions that refer to a materials board, dated 21st of August. Yep. Is that the correct one? That's this one, yes. Right, okay. Okay, so as long as we don't end up with the stripes that we see here, it it will be it will be textures. Sorry. It will be. It's a it's a, a gridded. It's a um, profile tile. So there are ins and outs. So it's not a flat tile. No, so I'm not. Be, I don't. I, I'm pleased that it's not a flat tile, but I, I don't want it to end up um, um, looking striped like it does on this. Yeah, it's just a so if, you, if you look at the that the tile that you have now, that the bottom, that's the profile of the tile. Oh, when right. when will you have the actual oh, sample? Right, thank you. Yeah. It, it's uh, it's in transit from Germany at the moment. Um, I can check with the supplier. And no, no, I'm just wondering whether or not we can impose a condition and so get it endorsed by council prior to CC. So yeah, I think that's fine. Well, um, yeah, you good approach. Yeah, we're, we're happy yeah. to pre present the real tile yeah. when it comes, just to make sure you're happy yeah. with it. But yeah, so we've anticipated this. We spoke to Jim offline and said, look, if um, we're, we're happy to continue to work with him and the team, you know, as we progress this if, uh, during uh, CC. And, um, you know, this last year, or well, particularly this last eight or nine months, we've been working in a collaborative way. And um, that's where we've arrived at today. And we've, yeah. we've said that Jim will continue to work with him uh, after today. Okay, then, very good. Um, many a slip between the cup and the lip, I say in the execution at times, so that's good. Uh, just um, going back to uh, the conditions, Jeff, you mentioned the one about the additional driveway in Beulah Street because that is to be used for a disabled um, parking space at grade. Uh, yes, sir. The, Madam Chair, the way that's been dealt with is is not in fact a condition. That's that's the recommendation to the panel is that the matters um, defer to um, de well to delegate the matter um, to um, to Director of Planning um, Services, um, but essentially um, for us to submit plans that delete that driveway. So effectively, uh, we're urging the panel to not adopt the recommendation, but to adopt an alternate recommendation, which is to approve the development subject um, to the plans before the panel today. Okay. No further questions from anybody? No. no. Right. Thank you all and submitters for making time this afternoon to address us. And um, our decision will be on the website Friday afternoon. Thank you all. Thank and you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And can I now move to the next item on the agenda, which is 24 East Crescent, um, East Crescent Street, McMahon's Point. And that's the demolition of the existing building on the site that we see today and um, a redevelopment of a new building containing five uh, residential apartments with parking. And I do have a number of people who wish to address the panel on this one, which is um, Brett Brown. You're there. I can see you. Uh, David McCready. I can see you there too. Um, uh, 
Professor Warwick, James Warwick, I can see you there. Thank you. Um, Michael De Georgi. Giorgio, thank you. Thank Madam you. Chair. Yes, and um, Greg Sitter. He was there. He's. I think he'll probably join back. He's in. Okay, he well, was right. in his car. Yeah, he was in his car very well. Uh, ne Neville Thomas. Uh, uh, Neville is just an observer, uh, Madam Chair. Fine. Thank you very much. Very well. And um, then we have the applicants team, which is Greg Boston, um, Paul Buljevic, uh, David Allen, observing, Nicholas Guzman, uh, and Michael Stanton, uh, observing. Okay, thank you. So can we start with the submitters? I invite you, Brett, to address the panel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um... I'm a town planning consultant acting for the owners of number 22 East Crescent Street. It's the uh, dwelling object site, I believe you. We we went onto every level of the property today, Brett. Yes, we did. I was, you're frozen. It's frozen. Okay, Brett, you're frozen. So we're going to move to David McCready. No, no, David McCready's, um, I won't do that. Um, Brett's back. Brett's back. Okay. Nice. You're frozen. You're on mute on your... now. No, on mute. Brett, you're on mute. Apologies, Thank panel. You. I might just have to turn my video off so I don't drop out again. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time today. Um, uh, you would have seen on site that um, this proposal will have some significant adverse impacts on number 22. Our areas of concern relate to two main areas of non-compliance of the proposal. Um, the first relates to the front setback. So it's a significant portion of the building sits forward of the existing building on the site. Um, and that is comprised predominantly of the balcony structures that sit forward of the proposed building. These are very large structures. They're oversized balconies, larger than the ADG requires. And they're very solid structures as well. So the impact of having that directly to the north of uh, my client's property is such that it will have significant privacy overshadowing and visual, uh, view impacts. Um, firstly, in relation to privacy, uh, these balconies are as close as three metres from the outdoor living areas um, and other balconies on my client's property. At present, the applicant proposes to partly screen these structures, but there's still some areas where people can stand within three metres of my client's balconies and view into their, their space. And obviously at that proximity, even people talking on the balcony will be probably audible from a distance of three metres. So we suggest that that be addressed by providing solid structure um, on the southern side of those balconies. Of course, council in their assessment has realized that, that that's a problem as well because it also overshadows and causes view loss um, from my client's property. So the council's solution to the issue is actually to delete the privacy screens whatsoever. So that's, that's a major problem for us because as I said, the balconies are within three meters of the open spaces on this property. And as you all know, the ADG requires 12 meter separation in such situations where there's no um, screening uh, or distance able to be provided between properties. In this case, a, a distance of three metres is just going to be a terrible effect on the amenity of, um, of my client's outdoor spaces. Um, and we don't agree that, that that's, that's a, an adequate solution. Um, in relation to the um, other impacts, um, The uh, stuff assessment report fails to consider the overshadowing of the main living areas and the balcony of my client's property. The impact is such that it will reduce the existing already deficient solar access from 1.5 hours to about one hour. It will also overshadow the main private open space of their property. Such impacts are contrary to the uh, controls that are in the ADG and council hasn't acknowledged that, that this impact even exists. Um, these impacts will be made even worse than what are indicated in the uh, council's assessment and also in the applicant's documentation. Because as I said, if we extend those privacy screens to the ends of those balconies to provide privacy, they'll have even greater impacts on overshadowing. 
Given the already limited solar access, we believe these impacts to be unreasonable. Um, the other uh, overshadowing impact relates to the top level of the building where um, there's the only north facing living room um, in the whole of the, the dwelling. Uh, you might have seen that on site today. And that's part of an, a, a relatively recent addition that my clients undertook in 2018. As part of that assessment, um, that level was required to be set back 1.5 metres from the level below. The issue with the proposal is um, it fails to comply with the side setback requirements of Council's DCP and also fails to comply with the top storey setback requirement of the DCP that applies to residential flat buildings. The impact that these non-compliances have on this window are, are substantial, reducing it from having currently six hours solar access to just one hour, which is at 9am. The staff assessment report in, incorrectly concludes that um, that window will have at least 50% sunlight during the rest of the day. As you would have seen in my submission that I made directly to you panel, um, the images show from councils, um, from, sorry, from the applicants' shadow diagrams that that window won't get anywhere near 50% of solar access during the day. And given the non-compliance, um, we suggest that a 1.5 metre setback at that top level would address this solar access issue and uh, that should be undertaken. Um, the other issue um, that results from the lack of compliance with the front setback, which I just might reiterate, is agreed to by council staff. They, they acknowledge that the balconies sit forward of what the building setback should be. Um, however, they conclude that the impacts are not unreasonable. So I've already pointed out the privacy impacts and the overshadowing impacts, but there's also significant view loss um, that results from, from this non-compliance. As you would have seen on site today, um, the primary views are in an easterly direction from this property, but unfortunately they're, they're obscured by existing vegetation and buildings. So the actual view in the direction of the street is, is pretty limited. And the full scope of the view goes to the north across uh, the side boundary of the subject site. And what we see there is, is very great, very high quality views of the uh, North Sydney CBD. And these are available from all levels um, on the eastern side of the building right up to the top terrace. The impact of uh, providing the privacy screens and increasing the size of these privacy screens is that the vast majority of that CBD view will be obliterated by that non-compliance with the front setback. Um, we know that Tenacity's advice is that um, if even a moderate impact is caused by a development that doesn't comply, it might be considered to be unreasonable. And that's certainly our conclusion here. And it's certainly the conclusion of council that the uh, impacts uh, can be described as at least moderate. Um, there are also some impacts in relation to some overlooking from the west facing bedrooms of the proposal. Um, that can be dealt with simply by a condition of consent. Uh, which requires those privacy screens that are proposed to be extended right to the end of the balcony. But unfortunately, uh, as pointed out in the council report, there's a there's a there's an issue with trying to provide um, a good outcome in relation to privacy, but also a good outcome in relation to overshadowing and um, and um, loss of views. Council's solution is to get rid of the the privacy screen. So to me, that's just just an unreasonable position to take. It's like my son's favourite game, which is called, what would you rather? Would you rather have your arms chopped off or would you rather have your legs chopped off? In this case, neither outcome is going to be satisfactory to my client without some significant amendments. So we'd ask you to refuse the application to allow the applicant to redesign the building. So it pulls that western, that eastern setback to comply with the uh, front setback control. Thank you very much. Um... Brett, do we have any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, we had the owner of the property that you've just made your submission on, um, Brett, who is here to address us as well, but I don't know whether you want to say anything, Mr McCready. Uh, yes, I would like to, if I may, Madam Chair. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to address the panel today. As Brett said, 
we're the owners of number 22 East Crescent Street adjoining the subject site to the south. And with our four children, it's our family home. We understand that development occurs uh, and will continue to occur in McMahon's Point, but it should be compliant development such that the impacts are shared. There's no reason the proposed development couldn't be compliant, but instead it breaches various requirements, including the height requirement, it breaches the eastern setback requirement, and there's no top level setback on the south side adjoining our home. Um, as a result, the impact on our home is very significant and no reason has been given to justify any non-compliance. Unfortunately, it simply appears to be a question of wanting to build a five-storey development in an area where the, crop, where the controls specify four. We think it's important to point out, as Brett mentioned, that we added a, a third storey recently. And even though our plans were fully compliant and our height um, was below the height requirement, Council nevertheless required us to lower our height even further. We were also required to set back the top story 1.5 metres from the levels below. We met those requirements, yet now Council is recommending approval of a development that breaches both of those same requirements. We're concerned about the inconsistency of that, and the result is that the impact on solar access and privacy and view loss is much greater than it would have been without that inconsistency. Um, as Brett mentioned, simply looking at the solar access, um, the access to our only north-facing living area window reduces from six hours to one hour a day, less than one hour a day at, at midwinter. The non-compliance would also result in other impacts uh, on privacy with direct viewing possible into our living areas from only three metres in some places and six metres in others, as Brett, Brett said, much less than the 12 metre requirement. And again, as Brett said, strangely, we think council's solution to the view loss issues that I'll also mention is to remove the privacy screens when privacy is already so significantly impacted in the living areas. We think this illustrates that the impact of the non-compliance is unreasonable. Uh, as to view loss, because of the development extending beyond the easterly setback on all levels and there not being a setback on the top level, our northerly views of the North Sydney skyline would, would basically be eliminated. It's not a situation of the views being shared between us and the development. Our view would be blocked and they would have both the easterly view and the uninterrupted northerly um, North Sydney skyline view. Uh, on the question of the um, privacy screens, angled louvers uh, would not solve the problem because the proposed balconies are so deep and extend so far to the easterly side of the property that wherever you were on the development on those balconies, um, no matter what the angle of those louvers were, you could still see into directly into our bedroom from any, sorry, into our living areas from any point where we were trying to look at the view. So the result of the developments proposed would be a building of excessive bulk and proximity, which would dominate our home and which would have unreasonable impacts on sunlight, on light generally and warmth, on privacy and on views, which are unreasonable and which would not result from a compliant proposal. Unfortunately, as council's assessment report itself demonstrates, the only solutions to these impacts are unreasonable in themselves. I'd like to raise one final point, uh, which relates to excavation. The proposed development has excavation extending uh, very close to our boundary and all the way to the northerly boundary, again, both in, in both cases, contrary to the controls. And there's been some concern about the accuracy of um, much of the material put before council, including geotechnical reports. And we would ask that um, if there's to be uh, any development allowed, that the, um, the documentation that the applicant would be required to provide to council and to the principal certifier also be provided to the neighbours of the adjoining properties um, to go some way to ameliorating any concern about accuracy and transparency of those materials. 
So thank you for the opportunity to address. And, and as I mentioned, we, we object to the proposal going ahead in its current form. Thank you, Mr. McCready. Um, now I will invite um, James Werrick to address the panel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think it might be uh, better for uh, Michael Giorgio, who is representing the owner of number 26, because that will therefore uh, uh, cover the immediate concerns of the neighbours, and I will approach it from the point of view of the community, if that's acceptable to the panel. Very well. Michael Giorgio. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, panel. Uh, so I'm the urban planning consultant on behalf of the owner of number nine, number tw at 26 East Crescent Street. And I have some material that I'd like to share with you that may assist the panel. But uh, prior to that, just to give some context, and I'd like to turn the panel's mind to the Maguire versus Randick City Council 2010 case law, where in that particular case, it relates, the principles relate very clearly to this particular matter and which provides clarity about unobstructed views to significant vistas across side boundaries, providing further clarity to the Tenacity Consulting versus Warringah 2004 principles of view sharing case law. In that particular case, the applicant sought to obstruct views to a neighboring property where the Commissioner Morris found that the primary view it agreed that the primary view from the adjoining neighbour was from the dining and the living room across the side boundary to an unobstructed significant vista of Coogee Beach. So keeping that in mind, the that matter was refused as a result of the key principle non-compliance with the DCP that caused that obstruction resulted in an amenity impact and um, also further other issues related to FSR non-compliance and height non-compliance, but the principal reason was a result of the view impact and the DCP non-compliance. So with that, I'll share my screen. So Madam Chair panel, I'd just like to highlight that the council's assessment report fails to actually show the true relationship with number nine uh, with unit number nine at 26 East Crescent Street and the actual um, view impact that's generated by the proposal. The images that you see on this page are actually the images generated by the applicant in their photo montage and view impact assessment, but I've added my notes and assessments. These views are from a standing position within the unit of number nine from the living room which then also extends back behind where this photo was taken to the dining room. What is clear and abundantly clear from these images is that the unit has significant views to Goat Island, which is a Sydney Harbour National Park identified item, as well as, state, as a state heritage item. The view also blocks the land water interface and the Illawarra, Illawarra Reserve and also the Peacock Point Reserve in Balmain, which is also identified as a, as a state heritage item. It is, um, it is clear that these items, as well as the land and water interface, will be completely devastated by the proposal. What results, or what is the function of this non-compliance, or this view impact, my apologies, is the non-compliance with Council's DCP. The DCP requires a rear setback, which has a 45 degree plane, high plane, um, from the rear of Middle Street. I've mapped this on the proposal, and it's clear from the image shown on the screen that if that 45 degree plane was applied properly by the applicant in this proposal, that by removing that rear portion of the top level, it would go a significant way to ameliorating and mitigating the view impacts to number nine at number 26 East Crescent Street. So just in summary, to be brief, because I know Professor Werrick would like to also make comments on behalf of the community. In summary, the proposal um, does not comply with the DCP. 
has significant devastating impacts as a result of visual impacts of, uh, on number nine of unit 26, sorry, of unit number nine at 26 East Crescent Street, um, and also has amenity impacts due to that form being projected further and enclosing the space at number at unit nine. Uh, as a result of that, I request that the application be refused. Thank you very much, Mr. Giorgio. And um, do panel members have a question? No, I think that's Thank you. Yeah. Very well. And um, if I could now move to our next speaker, um, I do have James listed here, but I also have somebody else from 26 um, East Crescent, uh, Greg Sitter. Are you there, Greg? Yes, you're on mute. Thank you. You're on mute. You're on mute. Uh, okay, thanks for allowing me to speak. Uh, basically, to keep it short, I, I basically agree with everything that Michael uh, Giorgio has just said. Right, very well. That's it then. That's all you wish to say. That's it. Thank you very much. Rightio, so now we'll go to James Warwick. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I am uh, James Warwick of Unit 14.5 East Crescent Street, McMahon's Point. I object to the proposed residential flat development at 24 East Crescent Street, McMahon's Point, DA 522, and thank the panel for the opportunity to present my response to the assessment report. In addition to my three written objections to the original DA and subsequent amendments submitted on the 22nd of August, 2022, the 11th of April, 2023, and the 3rd of August, 2023. As the assessment report outlines on page three, and documents on pages 22 to 26, North Sydney Council received 67 submissions from 37 correspondents on this development application following original lodgement of the plans in January, 2022. All submissions opposed the proposal. The assessment report does not mention that the objections include submissions by professional planners, as we've just seen, engaged by the owners of adjoining properties at 22 and 26 East Crescent Street, and a professional heritage consultant engaged by the owners of 26 East Crescent Street, a listed heritage item. Furthermore, the assessment report does not mention that the objections include three submissions by the Lavender Bay Precinct Committee based on unanimous resolutions passed at public meetings of the committee. This development application is strongly opposed by the immediate neighbours of the subject property and the community of McMahon's Point. The 67 submissions are summarised in point form on pages 2 to 26 of the assessment report. As can be seen, the objections are powerful, pertinent and informed. In my view, those objections relating to the siting, setbacks, height, bulk, scale, streetscape presentations, heritage impacts, traffic impacts, pedestrian access impacts, tree impacts, landscaped area impacts, and excavation impacts of the proposal have not been adequately addressed in amendments to the original DA and the assessment report. I support the objections that make clear the unacceptable impacts of the proposal on East Crescent Street. In this address, however, I wish to emphasize the unacceptable impacts of the proposal on Middle Street. The assessment report on page 13 refers to Middle Street as a lane. Although narrow, Middle Street is not a lane. It is a most distinctive ridgetop street of McMahon's Point, located wholly within the McMahon's Point South Conservation Area. The boundary of the conservation area lies on the western property line of the subject site, which in turn is located prominently on the rise of the street from Parker Street to the south. Middle Street is significant in terms of urban morphology and urban heritage. It is also significant in the everyday life of McMahon's Point. It provides access to a number of properties which have direct frontage to the street and convenient, much used level pedestrian access to the rear of the residential flats and occasional house such as number 22 located 
high on the western side of the east of East Crescent Street, including the subject property and uh, its immediate neighbors. The development proposal is located within North Sydney LEP R4 high density residential zone with a height limit of 12 meters. And immediately adjoining the R3 medium density residential zone of the McGowan's Point South Conservation Area with a height limit of 8.5 meters. The development proposal does not mediate this transition by conforming to the rear setback and top story setback guidelines of North Sydney DCP 2013 parts 1.4.6 and 1.4.7. The assessment report does not consider the objectives of these DCP provisions. The report neither states nor shows the extent of non-compliance of the proposal and fails to acknowledge that the subject site is located directly opposite the single-story double cottages of number 56 and 58 Middle Street, which are listed as contributory items to the, quote, cohesive sense of scale, unquote, of the conservation area in North Sydney DCP 2013 Appendix 1. The rear setback and top story setback guidelines of the DCP have objectives, have objectives which include to reinforce the characteristic pattern of setbacks and building orientation within the street, to control the bulk and scale of buildings, to ensure the size of new buildings are consistent with surrounding characteristic buildings and they are not significantly larger and characteristic buildings. A clear purpose of these guidelines on Middle Street is to mediate the scale transition from the 8.5 height limit and low scale character of the conservation area on the west with a 12 meter height limit in the R4 zone on the east. This height limit is exacerbated with respect to the 522 given that the ground level of the subject site is two meters above the street. Factoring in the parapet height at roof level, DA522 proposes a building mass located a mere 3.5 meters from the public footpath on the western boundary of the subject site, rising straight up to a height of 14.6 meters above street level, 5.6 meters higher than the existing building on the site. With no rear and top story setbacks, the proposal will be exceptionally obtrusive in the conservative, in the, sorry, in, pardon, in the conservation area streetscape, given its location forward of the rear facades of its immediate neighbors at 22 and 26 East Crescent, directly opposite the contributory single story double cottages at 56 and 58 Middle Street, and near the high point of Middle Street as it rises on the ridge top from Parker Street. To comply with the DCP gui guidelines, setbacks from the Middle Street property line should be 5.5 meters for the level three apartment and 10 meters for the level four apartment. The assessment report does not provide this information Indeed, the assessment report should have compared the non-complying proposal with a compliance scheme demonstrating the beneficial effect of the latter on the conservation area streetscape, the overshadowing of 22 East Crescent Street, and the view loss of 26 East Crescent Street. And you're, about, assessment... you're about to finish, James. I'm about to finish. Good, thank you. Yes, uh, instead, the assessment report endorses the proponent's non-compliance with North Sydney Development Control Plan. This is unacceptable. For North Sydney Council to ignore its DCP critically effect, effects, weakens the effect of its DCP overall. The principles applying to the value of DCP guidelines were established by the New South Wales Land and Environment Court in the 2004 case Stockland Development versus- can, 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 can we, James, can you just, um, we're all aware of all of the case law, et cetera, so if we can just, um, if you can just point out the relevant. Oh, I, I, issue. I, I, thank you, Madam Chair. But I, if I may, I would, I'd prefer to finish. And I've got one, one, one and a half paragraphs to go. Okay. Okay. But uh, I, I think I'll, it's I'll, I'll give you 30 seconds. Thank you, James. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, if I may respectfully request <laughs> this development application has been before North Sydney Council for 20 months. And I respectfully request more than 30 seconds to finish what I have to say. They are very important statements, which are very important for North Sydney Council and what it has to- Okay, well, can you can you finish your statement? And as I said, we're, we normally do have a time limit and I didn't mention that earlier. But in that regard, I'll let you finish, James, okay? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, that, that, that. 
as I say, principle three states a development control plan, which has been consistently applied by a council, will be given significantly greater weight than one which has only been selectively applied. DA 532 is part of a development trend in North Sydney, a knockdown of an old apartment block with multiple affordable units and replacement with a small number of luxury apartments. This trend is evidenced in McMahon's point by the development of 3 East Crescent Street, the current approval for 3 Parker Street, and this DA, which proposed, proposes a knockdown of 13 affordable units for five upmarket units. Given the topographic relief and tight pattern of urban development in North Sydney, the DCP guidelines are the principal protectors of residential amenity and neighbourhood character in the face of the knockdown trend. North Sydney Council should uphold its DCP. I urge the panel to refuse DA 522 for 24 East Crescent Street. Thank you, Madam Chair and panel members. Thank you, James, very much. Um, now, we will hear from the applicants team. You're all welcome to stay on the line. And as I've said with previous agenda items, I would like you to address some of the issues or the issues as far as you can that have been raised by submitters. Uh, we have Greg Boston and the architect Paul Bullsrec. Um, and the others are observing only. So we're in your hands as to how you wish to progress, Greg. Yes, thanks, uh, Madam Chair, panel members. Um, unfortunately, Paul wasn't able to attend today. So we've got Keith Lamb from PBD Architects here to answer any questions that might arise in regards to the architectural detailing, but otherwise I, I'll attempt to, uh, to address all the issues raised. Um, look, we'd like to um, first... Uh, can I, can I just out. check? Just, just sorry, one moment, Greg. Um, Peter, do we still have the um, objectors online? Yep. Oh, they are. They're all in the background, aren't they? They are in the background. Okay, right here. Thanks very much, Greg. Yep. Yeah, look, we'd like to thank council staff for um, their guidance and assistance over the last 18 months that this application's been um, considered. It, it certainly... Um, has its challenges and, and one of those or two of the primary challenges relate to the two immediately adjoining properties. Uh, you're probably aware from the statement of environmental effects that there was formal offers um, made to purchase um, the adjoining property to the south, 22 East Crescent Street, on the basis that these properties are zoned R for high density residential and council certainly wanted us to ensure that we achieve the zone objectives as much as possible with the zone objectives certainly going towards encouraging a high density residential outcome within the R4 zone. Um, on the basis that we weren't able to secure number 22 East Crescent Street and that number 26 East Crescent Street is heritage listed, we were certainly um, caught in the, in the situation where we needed to come up with a design that was responsive not only to a single dwelling house located to the south of the site, um, but also the, the heritage sensitivities associated with 26 East Crescent Street. Um, we certainly endorsed the recommendation contained within the report. Um, I have circulated, and I'm not sure whether the panel uh, has some um, suggested amendments to some conditions. I'm not sure if you've got that in front of you or whether you'd like me just to go through them briefly. First of all, I'd like you to address any concerns. Can we leave the conditions to the end, please, Greg? Sure, absolutely. Look, in relation to uh, the concerns raised in relation to the East Crescent Street setback, I'll share a screen if that's okay. Is that sharing, Madam Chair? Yes, it is, thank you. Yeah, is okay. So the uh, you should be seeing an architectural plan on the screen. So um, through the um, uh, the feedback we got from council's design uh, design excellence panel and also from council's planners through the assessment process, the East Crescent Street building facade was pulled back to the same facade alignment established by the existing residential flat building on the site, which obviously also. Uh, responds to the setback established on 22 East Crescent Street and sits behind the setback established by number 26 to the to the north. 
yes, there are balcony projections extending forward of that primary facade alignment, but the projections are consistent with the balcony projections established on the adjoining properties. And in fact, established uh, along this section of East Crescent Street generally. Uh, on the upper level, the, uh, the building um, facade has been pulled back further to again align with the upper level addition um, on 22 East Crescent Street um, with, the, uh, with an open terrace extending out to the building facade alignment um, established by the, by the lower levels. Uh, we say that in relation to um, the privacy um, interface concerns that have been raised by the adjoining property owners, whilst there's a condition currently in the draft um, consent in relation to the removal of the privacy screen, certainly from the lower levels, uh, we'd raise no objection if the panel, if the panel was of a mind to retain uh, those privacy screens as, as integrated elements um, in the overall building design. Um, but noting that, um, and I hope the panel observed this this morning at their site view, that a majority of properties along this section have balconies orientated to take advantage of the harbour views. And there is a general paucity of fixed privacy screens um, associated with those, uh, with those balconies. That is, there's a general trade-off between absolute privacy and view retention, particularly where those views are obtained at an oblique angle across the side boundaries. Uh, we'd also note from this image here that the adjoining property at 22 East Crescent Street is, has been constructed on a nil um, boundary setback to, uh, to that common uh, southern boundary. Um, in relation to uh, the concerns raised uh, in relation to uh, view loss, I'll just show you another image here, just let me know when it's kicked over. Yes. Um, so there was some concerns and some montage um, images uh, from the upper level apartment at number 26 East Crescent Street. And then I just asked the panel to, to note a few observations. One is that um, the views that are obtained from that particular apartment are obtained from portions of the building that themselves are well above the, the building height standard. In fact, another level above the height standard that uh, whilst there is some view affectation that um, consistent with the assessment report, when you take into account the totality of the views available from the adjoining properties, and those views include views to the east towards the harbour, Harbour Bridge. Um, is this, sorry, Greg, is this from no, unit number nine? Yes, correct. Thank you. That's correct. Um, that when you take into account the totality of the views, the fact that um, the, uh, the the building height breaching element um, doesn't come into play in relation to view impact from any adjoining property, that is the, the breaching element of the development standard contained within the LEP, and the fact that the massing of the development has been dictated to a, to a fair extent by the one, the inability to consolidate with the southern adjoining property, and then the um, heritage sensitivities, which has meant that the building has been peeled back um, from uh, the common boundary with the heritage item in that northwestern corner um, to achieve a more appropriate spatial relationship. And that spatial relationship and certainly the building's presentation uh, to Middle Street was something that was supported by um, Council's um, Design Excellence Panel and endorsed by Council's Heritage Officer. And to that extent, um, we believe that the setbacks established to both street frontages are contextually appropriate. They're sensitive in terms of uh, the heritage item on the adjoining site. And they also maintain reasonable residential amenity to a dwelling house, which is located within an R4 high density zone, and which is likely to be developed itself um, sometime in the, in the future. In relation to the concerns raised regarding excavation um, and uh, potential impacts on the adjoining property, I note that the draft conditions of consent uh, incorporate conditions in relation to dilapidation reporting, uh, vibration uh, monitoring and also dust suppression. And uh, we certainly don't raise any objections in relation to those conditions. Uh, you would have noted that there is a, a fall across the land of approximately a, a story in height 
Um, we believe that the lowest level apartment as it presents to Middle Street strikes a good balance in relation to uh, the established um, ground lines, uh, not only on this site, but also established by the two immediately adjoining properties. As the site falls away towards East Crescent Street, you'll note that historically there was a tennis court, uh, which stretched across uh, the boundary between 26 and 24 East Crescent Street. And the landscape outcome, which has been achieved on the lower area of the property, um, does have a heritage context attached to that. And uh, to that extent, um, Council's Heritage Officer wanted to see that continuity in terms of established levels um, between the two properties relative to that particular street frontage. Um, apart from that, I'm happy to, um, to go to any particular issues that were raised that I haven't uh, touched on. Um, I will note that the application does rely on a clause 4.6 variation request um, in relation to the building height in the northeastern corner of the property. We were made aware during the assessment process that there was actually an accessible subfloor area that we weren't aware of when we originally lodged the application. We've had that subfloor area fully surveyed. Um, it seems to be a sort of an anomaly in terms of the subfloor, but um, certainly triggers the need for a clause 4.6 variation request. Um, we say that the request is well founded. The environmental planning grounds go towards the minor nature of the breach, uh, the fact that it is isolated to one particular um, subfloor area. And also in terms of um, varying the height standard in that one corner it provides for a more consistent and cohesive streetscape presentation uh, where we maintain or pick up on the parapet levels established by the adjoining properties, in particular the heritage item to the north. Uh, so we say that the, there are sufficient environmental planning grounds and that that clause 4.6 variation request is well founded. Um, just moving on to the conditions, I did send an email to Council dated the 4th of September. If the panel doesn't have that, I'll just walk through them very quickly. Okay, then. Mm -hmm. um, condition A1, which just picks up the plans and documentation relied upon, uh, it just references an older structural letter. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that the most recent uh, uh, structural letter was picked up in the consent, and we've given you the reference to that. It's the report dated 30th of the 6th, uh, 2022. Um, in relation to condition C19, which relates to stormwater management, there's a condition there for stormwater reuse for irrigation and toilet flushing. Uh, we just asked the panel put their mind towards uh, limiting that to irrigation only, um, noting that recent experience with having reuse in toilets, there is a discoloration issue, which um, uh, is unfortunate. But um, uh, whilst not determinative for us, we certainly would ask that the panel put their mind towards just a tweak with that condition. Um, conditions C20 and G8 relate to uh, stormwater pump out systems. Now, I think the previous scheme, the panel might be aware that originally the car parking was accessed off Middle Street via a lift. Um, given there was a number of, um, or quite quite a significant number of concerns raised with car parking from that frontage, uh, the alternate access arrangement through the existing garage opening on East Crescent Street was uh, was made, and and that means that the basement is now uh, just free draining um, and therefore there's no pump out required and those conditions um, can be deleted. Finally, condition C26 rightfully uh, picks up that trees T3 and T4 on the adjoining property at 22 East Crescent Street are protected trees and that application for pruning would need to be made to council. At the moment, the condition as drafted, and this is the fourth sentence in that condition, simply says no canopy pruning shall be permitted to uh, trees T3 and T4. Uh, we just ask that there be some words added to the end of that particular sentence saying unless otherwise approved by council, which would enable potentially in the future negotiations between the two property owners, owners consent being obtained and an application to prune that tree being approved by council. Um, apart from that, we are happy with the conditions. Uh, the panel will be aware that there's a significant 
um, contribution payable for potential loss of affordable housing. Uh, we uh, have checked that condition in terms of the figure. We are comfortable with it. Um, and to that extent, we don't raise any other objections in relation to the conditions as drafted. Um, happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Can I just ask you the question with respect to um, setting back the upper level one and a half mm -hmm. metres further to um, number 24? Yeah, sure. Um, oh, 22, 22, 22, sorry. 22. Yeah. Um, look, there, there, there would be an ability to set the building back a further 1.2 metres. However, um, we say that that is unnecessary under the circumstances, and that goes towards the fact that if you look at, well, it depends on what the outcome you're after in terms of that additional setback. As I said, the inability to consolidate with that property um, has, has certainly been challenging, as has the fact that it's located on the boundary. Um, we say that solar access is, is reasonably maintained to that property. And I, and I asked the panel members to focus on the view from the sun and um, the, the isometric shadow diagrams, which clearly demonstrate that in the morning, um, the east facing living room and balcony areas of that property will continue to receive solar access. Um, during the middle of the day, um, the upper level living room windows um, will still receive some solar access until the afternoon where the west facing living room, private open space area above the garage will then receive another two hours or so of solar access. So we say that in the context of this being a dwelling house in an R4 zone, and we appreciate that the requirement for solar access for a dwelling house is greater than if there was a residential flat building next door. But we say over the spread of hours between nine and three that it's not unreasonable to have to move uh, or relocate yourself within a dwelling house to receive solar access in the morning, during the day and in the afternoon. And that when you have a look at the totality of, of solar access maintained that what is proposed is fair and reasonable. The increase in the setback will obviously reduce um, floor space, it would um, require a reconfiguration of the circulation core um, and uh, lift core. Um, there'd be transfer beam requirements and um, also a, you know, a compromise in terms of the amenity of, of that upper level apartment. And to that extent, we believe that the assessment report has been very thorough in relation to identifying the DCP controls uh, which, as you'd be aware, uh, the, um, the Act requires the consent authority to apply a degree of flexibility in circumstances where it can be demonstrated that the outcomes or the objectives can be achieved. And we say that that has been comprehensively addressed, not only in the supplementary statements that have been prepared throughout this assessment process, but also within the council assessment report, which can only be described as comprehensive and extremely thorough and rigorous in relation to um, the assessment uh, of this particular application. So we would certainly um, endorse the, uh, the panel's um, support of the recommendation as put. And, and um, I did have another question in the meantime. Madam, Madam Chair. No, yes, one moment. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. McCready, this is not a question and answer. Thank no, I understand, I understand that, Madam Chair. Yep. I didn't wish yep. to pose a question. I simply no. wish to ask whether it was appropriate to correct a factual inaccuracy that Mr Boston had made. Well, um, I ask whether that's appropriate or not. That's all. It's, it's not appropriate, but you may you may just say, but realising that this is the last time we have any further comments backwards and forwards, what were you going to say? I understand. Mr Boston was saying that the sun... The, um, it's appropriate to move to a western living area where the sun comes in. There is no western living area in our property where the sun comes in. There's no living living area on the western side where the sun would come in, according to the diagrams. Okay, thank you very much. Thank now, you. Um, Mr. Boston, I was just going to ask you um, another question, and that's in respect of um, privacy screens on balconies, um, and what what. What is, what is proposed, what is recommended, what are you recommending? Um, I understand that where we have water views, uh, that a sh you know, sharing of views and mutual overlooking is not uncommon. 
but um, I'd just like to understand what the proposal is for the um, uh, privacy or lack or, or privacy screens or no privacy screens or half privacy screens or glazing or something or other. I'm just trying to understand what you're recommending. Sure. Um, look, in relation to my understanding is that um, uh, any privacy concerns in relation to fenestration in the in the south and northern facades, that is the side boundary fa facing facades, has been dealt with by way of either privacy screening or appropriate offsetting. So um, the screens that my understanding is the screens that um, the recommendations seek to remove are those located on the east facing balconies, and I can bring you up the plan which shows them, if you can just bear with me. Yeah, okay. Just let me know when that's sharing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's the my understanding, um, and I know the council assessing officers in the room, but um, is that it's these screens um, located on the on the southern end of uh, of those balconies um, that they the condition seeks to remove those. Um, they are set back three meters um, from the boundary. Um, they they're lightweight in nature. Um, we took them into account in relation to the the view analysis. And uh, we believe that uh, that those screens in themselves don't unreasonably um, contribute to, uh, to to view affectation. Um, so at the moment, it's a just a an integrated architectural screen element, um, which has been resolved by the uh, by the project architect. Uh, as I said, we're we're very comfortable for them to be retained. But if the panel was of a mind to go with the recommendation or even reduce their depth by a half yep. um, and there, look, there was some criticism about these being overly generous deep terraces the the, the mid-level terraces are 2.4 meters the minimum under the adg and again that was something that was requested um, by council's planner during the assessment process so if they extended for for half of that so maybe extended out 1.2 meters um, then, um, then that I think that would be something which which would um, just strike that balance between uh, privacy and and view retention. Okay, just go back to that shared screen you had a moment ago, and in that regard, I'd like you to address the point that has been raised about set back to Middle Street. To Middle Street of the upper level. Yeah, so so it's th this area here is is what's been raised so again um you know this this was the scheme that was presented to the design excellence panel it was the scheme that was presented to council's heritage advisor um and uh on balance it was determined that in terms of the overall streetscape along Mid middle street um you would have gone along that street uh, today um, that there's really no established building or consistent building alignment in the street. Um, the existing building on the site um, comes through on this alignment. There's that fantastic external fire stair, which um, then further encroaches into that setback area. But the upper level has been sort of set back and recessed and pulled back from that north uh, northwestern corner, as I said, to address the heritage issue. And we say that it provides for an appropriate um, streetscape, heritage conservation, and maintains reasonable amenity to the to the adjoining property. Could I just ask a question on that? So the rear set, well, it's not a rear, the front set back to Middle Street, that was uh, predominantly based on the existing built form rather than um, the adjoining buildings or the that profile that we were, were shown before um, which I think might be a rear setback control, is it? The profile we were shown? That's a good question because you could take it either way under the DC. Yeah, so just, I guess I'm asking, oh, that's a bit muddled, but the, the middle street setback analysis is predominantly yeah. based on the existing built form rather than either a front or a rear setback control in the DCP? 
Oh, look, partially, look, it, it, I guess um, it's looking for an appropriate contextual fit. Um, what this diagram here shows is the outline of the existing building um, on the site um, relative to, to the setbacks, I guess, um, that, that uh, the proposal landed at. So the, the primary building facade has been pushed back um, further into the street. Um, there's, there's been a fair bit of massing removed, particularly from... Uh, that northwestern corner, as I said, to open up that view line to the to the heritage item. But um, yeah, look, it was looking at because there was no sort of consistent established setback in the street. It was looking at the objectives um, of of the controls, and then it was also had that layer of a, a heritage item to the north that that needed a greater curtilage, um, particularly in that northwestern corner and also um, trying to protect residential amenity to a single dwelling house in an R4 zone, which we believe we've done appropriately without compromising the future development potential of that adjoining site as well, which I think is a relevant matter for consideration when the objective of that R4 zone is to encourage high yep. density residential development. So, so if I look at your DA202, there's an area on Middle Street that is above the existing building and it would also probably contravene council DCP. That's the south elevation. Uh, yeah, look, there's, um, look, the, the upper level uh, of the development to middle uh, street wouldn't comply with the numeric provision. Um, but as I said, when um, you know, given the particular circumstances of this site, um, yeah, don't go back one. over it. We're, we're, yeah, <laughs> please. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, do you have some questions? No. 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 No questions. No further questions from any of the other panel members. Um, and I would like to thank all the submitters, and I would like to thank the applicants team uh, for making their submissions to us this afternoon to assist our determination of this matter. So thank you all very much and you can expect a decision on the website uh, by close of business Friday. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Thank you.